All righty. Uh, there was this Jewish man, and he was sitting in a, in a restaurant, and he was reading an Arab newspaper. Well, that's kind of unusual. His friend walked in, and he said, Moshe, what in the world are you doing reading an Arab newspaper? And he said, well, here's the thing. I've always read the Jewish newspaper. I've always read it. And what do I read when I get it? It's like I read that uh, Jews are being persecuted. Israel's being attacked. Um, Jews are disappearing through dissemination and intermarriage. Uh, Jews are living in poverty. He said, it's just so depressing. But when I pick up the Arab newspaper, it says uh, Jews own all the banks. Jews control the media. Jews are all powerful and rich. Jews rule the world. Their news is so much better. Sometimes it's a matter of perspective, isn't it? Well, as we study more the history of the Jewish people today and, and see the richness of it, uh, I think there's, there's so much we can learn. And some of it is so good and some of it is not so good. But we do not want to repeat the mistakes that have been, been made in the past. We want to learn and move forward. So let's... First, begin with a word of prayer. Oh, Father God, we praise you, our mighty, holy Lord, and we thank you for your presence in this place today. We thank you for those who are in this place to study your word and those who are with us online. Guide us now, oh God, through the study of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I don't know about you, but I love watching Bible movies. Okay, and, and there's, there's a series, and I like series too, that's real popular right now, The Chosen. How many of you have watched that? And I love The Chosen. Ooh, a lot of hands. Uh, but I like even going back, even as a kid, I loved that once a year the Ten Commandments would be on TV. And that was like usually uh, uh, leading up to Easter. And uh, the, it was just so, so good, and there was so much biblical truth in it. Yeah, it had a little Hollywood in it, too, of course, as do all other movies. But so I started looking to see, well, are there movies about Solomon, specifically Solomon and, Bathsheba, uh, and, and the Queen of Sheba? And so I found one, 1997, Ben Cross was in it. Never saw it, never even heard about it. There was another one in 1995, uh, Solomon and Sheba, and it had Holly Berry and Jimmy Smith. Never saw it, never heard of it. So I went back further to 1959, and there was a movie, Solomon and Sheba, and that is Yul Brenner with hair. <laughs> I didn't recognize him. And this is after the Ten Commandments and the King and I, where he had become very famous with his bald head, but yeah, he looks different with hair. And Gina Lola Brigida is his co-star as the Queen of Sheba. And so this was actually a pretty big movie. But if you watch it, and I sent a little bit of the trailer in it, it is a hot mess. I mean, it is no Cecil B. DeMille, let me tell you. I don't, I, I don't know who the director was, but it wasn't, it wasn't Cecil B. DeMille who really tried to stay close to the Bible. But the legends about uh, Solomon and the Queen of Sheba are many, many, many. And they go way, way, way back in time. And it's not just Hollywood and books that have made a big deal about it. Bible scholars and theologians and everyday people have tried to learn more about the Queen of Sheba and what this relationship really was. So what we're going to do, and we're in the Old Testament, so we're going to be going fast, but I'm going to stay a little bit longer on chapters 10 and 11 as it talks about Solomon. And then we're going to go into several chapters very quick that I'll kind of summarize more of. And that's what we'll do every week in the Old Testament. There'll be one major character or story that I'll kind of center on and then we'll, we'll summarize and, and keep moving forward, okay? Um, I'd like to finish before Jesus comes, but if he comes early, that's okay too, right? <laughs> that's, that's okay. Okay. So, uh, chapter 10 of 1 Kings, verse 1. 
Now, when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She came uh, to Jerusalem with great retinue, with camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind. Now, the queen of Sheba had heard of Solomon. Why? Because at this point, he was considered the wisest man in the world, probably the wealthiest man in the world. He was the king of the uh, most powerful kingdom in that part of the world. And, you know, who wouldn't want to go and meet this guy, right? And see, is it really true? Is he really that smart and that wise and that wealthy and that powerful? So she makes this trip, and... Uh, Scholars today believe that uh, Sheba was from Saba, which is, if, if we've got the map up here. Okay, this is an ancient map. And so if you're looking at it, you see the big uh, chunk here that's Arabia. That's Saudi Arabia today. And the southwest corner of it, it says Arabian kingdoms on it. That is where uh, Saba would have been. Now today that's Yemen going all across the bottom of that. But that was where the city of Saba and uh, this kingdom was. And so she would have, it, it said that that place did a lot of trade with spices and, and precious, uh, precious metals and stones. And that they would take it up and over to Egypt, up through Israel, over to Mesopotamia, and even all the way over to the choir loft, which is India. Okay. <laughs> So uh, it was, it was uh, you know, a, a country that itself had a good amount of, of wealth and prestige. And if we look at uh, history, it also tells us that that area had, several, had a dynasty of queens more so than kings back in early history, even leading up to the 8th century. There were frequently queens that were in charge instead of kings. Now, we don't know about her. It doesn't tell us if she was sent by the king as just a, an ambassador or if she was the head of the dynasties. We don't know that. There's a lot we don't know, and, and so that's why people like to take it and go, ooh, I bet, you know, whatever, like they slept together. Yeah. That's the big one. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us that, but let's, let's in verse 2 where it says, She came to Jerusalem with great retinue and with camels bearing spices and all this. And when she came to Solomon, just the phrasing of when she came to him, they're saying, well, she was coming to him for more than, than um, knowledge. Okay? It's worded a little different in some of the texts. Okay, so anyway, uh, let's look at, where, at a map today because I always like to put it in perspective. I don't know if you're like me, but here's a Middle East map of today. And so, again, you see uh, Israel's that little tiny purple stretch right there. It's on the crossroads of the world. I should point to this side sometimes too, right, so that y'all can see. I always go to my right. But anyway, the... Uh, they were on the crossroads of the world. It was a major trade route. And so uh, today, Yemen is right down there, where, right where I said it was. How about that? Saudi Arabia. Here's Egypt over here. There's the Sinai Peninsula dipping down. Uh, and so uh, Solomon had trade going up and down the Red Sea here from both sides, from the e Egyptian side and up the Gulf of Aqaba side, as well as trade in the Mediterranean, and because he had a whole fleet of ships, and we saw that kind of at the end of last week's lesson. Now, um, as she came with these hard questions, uh, she, her purpose was not to just do a bunch of riddles and see if he could answer the riddles. It, was, it goes much deeper than that. She is testing to see, is he really a good businessman? What are the commercial strengths of this country? What are his ethics? What is his character? Would he be a good ally for us? So it was, uh, it was a business, political, cultural 
thing as well as, yeah, I just want to see if he's as smart and great as, as uh, I've heard. So it was uh, customary for a visitor to bring a gift to a royal audience like this, but that also implies that it was a trade mission. Uh, the caravan would have been quite a caravan because it's 1,550 miles from southwestern Arabia, Saba, where she was, up to Jerusalem. She probably would have stayed six months to a year, so she would have gotten a really good look at what was going on. And, uh, and then she's loaded with, with gifts, and, um, you know, it's just kind of, Interesting, she's coming to see Solomon with camels and spices and gold. Does that remind you of another trip that takes place in the New Testament? Um, anyway, uh, let's look at verse 3. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath left in her. No more breath. Take my breath away. Okay, she was left breathless. She was overwhelmed. I mean, she sees all of this down to the way the table is set and the uniforms that his servants are wearing and the beauty of the food and the palace and the temple and the magnificence even of the sacrifices. It was something that, that left her breathless. And so from even the drinking vessels to... Uh, the, the accommodations, uh, it, it was something that was spectacular. So history includes this as an example of something that is a true story. But she was probably one of many heads of states and ambassadors who came to see Solomon during this time. And, and so we can't just think, oh, well, one queen came to see him. This probably happened on a regular basis, people coming to see the king. Verse 6, And she said to the king, The report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom. But I did not believe the reports until I came, and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half of it was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpass the report that I heard. Happy are your people, and that can be translated men or people. Uh, happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and has set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. He has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. So her statement acknowledges his wisdom, his wealth, and his spiritual inheritance from the Lord. He said, she, she is saying here, God has blessed you, and that's because, and, and he's the one who has set you on the throne, and he is the one who has. Uh, done this because he loved Israel forever. So she's picked up on a few things while she's been there. And he's made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. So she is acknowledging not only what he has, but what God has done for him. Verse 10, then she gave the king 120 talents of gold. Now one talent is 75 pounds. So she brought a, you know, caravan full of, uh, of gold with her, tremendous amount, and a very great quantity of spices, 
which were so valuable in the ancient day and still so popular. If you've been to the Middle East, you will still to this day find spice markets that are gigantic and have every kind of spice you could ever think of or imagine. So she brought some really high quality um, uh, spices, some precious stones. And it says, never again came such an abundance of spices as these that the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Verse 11, moreover, the fleet of Hiram, now Hiram was a king that was just north of Israel there along the Mediterranean Sea. He's the one we talked about last week who sent all the, all the wood that was needed, cypress and cedar and uh, Amalgam wood down the, uh, you know, on rafts down the Mediterranean to Joppa, and then they took it across land to Jerusalem to build the uh, temple. So there's Hiram appearing again, and he has, he's had kind of a, a wonderful relationship with Solomon as well in commerce and trade and friendship. It says, uh, <clears throat> Hiram, which brought gold from Ophir, so he, had, he brought some gold too, from Ophir a very great amount of amalgam wood and precious stones. And the king made of the amalgam of wood supports for the house of the Lord and for the king's house. Also they made lyres and harps for the singers. No such amalgam wood has come or been seen to this day. And King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all that she desired. Whatever she asked, besides what was given her by the bounty of King Solomon. So she turned and went back to her own land with her servants. So we see here that she gets a parting gift. And like I said, she had probably, they estimate, have been there, you know, six months, maybe a year. And so she has seen all of this. There is nothing, you know, uh, about a relationship here. So where did that all get started? Uh, and, 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 you know, everybody likes a good juicy love story, right? That's nothing new. That's nothing new. Now, we're going to see in the next chapter that Solomon does have 700 wives and 300 concubines. So what's one more, right? I mean, so it could have been. I'm just saying. It doesn't say they didn't do anything. It doesn't say they did. So we don't know. But there are many legends, uh, some that they had an affair, some that he married her, and that they had a son. Uh, one line says that the son was Nebuchadnezzar of that line leading down to him, but we, that can be proven false pretty easily. The other one was that they had a son by the name of the I, who was the progenitor of Ethiopia's royal dynasty. And so according to Ethiopian tradition, that's what happened. And they believe it so strongly that they have a church that has been there for centuries in Ethiopia called St. Mary's, and they claim to have the Ark of the Covenant in it. And they say that uh, when the temple, you know, like almost 400 years later from Solomon's time, was being ramshacked and destroyed by the Babylonians, that uh, the ark was sent to Ethiopia because of the line of Solomon's family that was there. And so they, they believe that they have it and that they have kept it till today. They have a high priest there that he is the only one who can ever go in and see it. And... And, and no one else gets to see it until he dies, and then the next guy in line goes in to see it. You can watch documentaries about this, by the way, if you want to on YouTube. But uh, there's, there's no real strong credibility to that. I'll, I'll just say that. That's not something that, that I believe. Um, I, in fact, I'm not going to make any predictions about where the Ark of the Covenant is. It may be in that warehouse where Indiana Jones and the, you know, I don't know. Um, no predictions here. But um, <clears throat> there, how did they get Ethiopia out of that? Well, if you'll look back just in a second at that map, the current day map. Okay, so Yemen is down here. That's where Saba would have been. Right across there in the purple is Ethiopia. So it was just a hop, jump, and a dive to get over there if that was the case. Now, there's uh, also... 
uh, in, in the works of Josephus, and Josephus, other than the Bible, Josephus has more ancient Jewish Israelite history than any other book. And uh, it is, he has the antiquities of the Jews. He goes all the way back to Genesis, telling the stories of the Bible and doing like a commentary on them and adding some things to it. Now, he lived in the first century A.D., so he is even around for the destruction of Herod's temple uh, in 70 A.D., but he researches and go back and, and, and has so much history. Anyway, so I, I was reading this week about what he has to say about Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, and he says that she was from, that she was a queen of Egypt and Ethiopia. Now, like I say, most scholars today look at the Saba and the, that as more the, the real place. But, but the whole thing about this story is not where she was from. It's about what she came and saw and, and the state of the nation of Israel at that time and that she recognized that God had been very influential in Solomon having this place in history. It never says that she believed in God, but at least she recognized what God had done through Solomon and how he had been blessed. Now, how do we know it's a true story? Well, what do I always say? The best commentary on the Old Testament is the New Testament. So when we get to the life of Jesus in the Gospels, Matthew 12, 42, talks about her. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. And see, something greater than Solomon is here. And so we have Jesus speaking, and he's speaking to some uh, Pharisees who are, you know, giving him a really hard time about some stuff. And he's saying, okay, you will be judged for what you know. And even the queen of Sheba knows this. And, but that last phrase is so important. Something, listen to the wisdom of Solomon and see, something greater than Solomon is here. So Jesus is making a really bold statement to Pharisees saying, you think he's wise? I'm wiser. You think he's great? I'm greater. And so we, we see the relationship that he sees with um, the prestige of Solomon, and yet he, he claims to be even greater. Now in chapter 10, beginning in verse 14, it says, Now the weight of the gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Now, right away, you read 666, and a lot of you went to the Mark of the Beast in Revelation, right? Okay, I am not saying that, he, that Solomon foreshadows the Antichrist or the Beast. The numbers are the same. There are some people who would connect the two. Uh, I'm just reading what the Bible says. It goes on and says, Besides that which came from the explorers and the business of merchants and from all the kings of the West and from the governors of the land, Solomon made 200 large shields of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. These would have been tremendous and, of course, very expensive. And he made 300 shields of uh, beaten gold three minutes of gold, so some that were, were small, smaller. And then the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. That was part of his palace. It describes his, um, his throne now. Listen to this. The king also made a great ivory throne and overlaid it with the finest gold. The throne had six steps, and at the back of the throne was a calf's head, and on each side of the seat were armrests and and two lions standing beside the armrests, while 12 lions stood there, one at the end of each of the step, uh, at the end of each step of the six steps. The like of it was never made in any kingdom. 
It goes on to say even his drinking vessels were made of gold. And that there was so much gold, he didn't even like silver anymore. It was like, eh, that's nothing. And, uh, but we see in verse 23, it says, uh, Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his mind. Every one of them brought his, brought his present, articles of silver and gold, garments, myrrh, spices, horses, and mules, so much year by year. So it just continued year after year after year. He would receive all these gifts and presents. Verse 9. Uh, I mean, sorry, not verse 9. Verse 26. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he had stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. And the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stone, and he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamores of Shephelah. And Solomon, uh, Im Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt and Q. And the king's traders received them from Q at a price. A chariot could be imported from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And so, through the king's traders, they Im were imported to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. Okay, so things are at the high point of Israel's history. There is peace in the land. There is wealth. They've got a great king, full of wisdom, honored by nations all over the world. They, they honor him so much that they just continue year after year bringing him expensive gifts. Chapter 11. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women. Now, that is an understatement if I ever saw one. Along with the daughter of Pharaoh, which we learned about right after he became king, there was a trade agreement with Egypt, and so he married uh, Pharaoh's daughter, and that's common. And so he's obviously making a lot of trade agreements here. It says, then he has a Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn your heart away, uh, will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. Okay, when we go back and look at uh, Deuteronomy which is, M Moses writes this, at the end of his life, the people are right there. They've come from Egypt out of captivity. They've wandered for 40 years. They're right there on the door of the promised land. They're about to go in, on in, cr cross the Jordan and go on in. And, and he knows he's not going on in. But he gives them a review of the laws. And that's what Deuteronomy means. Deutero means second, and anomy means law. So it's the second law giving. And he expounds on it in three great sermons so that they know when they go into the land what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. So Deuteronomy 7, 1 says, <clears throat> When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away the many nations uh, from before you, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Parasites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Mosquito Bites, and the Termites. <laughs> it says seven nations, but that's nine. Okay, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, you must devote them to complete destruction. You must make no covenant with them uh, and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. 
Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. But thus you shall deal with them, and you shall break down their altars, dash them to pieces in uh, their pillars, and chop down their asherim, which is a goddess, pagan goddess, and burn their carved images with fire. So he has given his people specific instructions, and it has nothing to do with the races. It's not, it, it, it has everything to do with their religion. These were pagan peoples who worshipped multiple pagan gods and had rituals that go so totally, uh, so much immorality was connected with it. Uh, these things, I mean... Uh, there were male and female prostitutes at the temple. They had no trouble getting their husbands to go to church. Let's just say <laughs> it was an experience. But that's what was in place, okay? Verse 3, Solomon had 700 wives, princesses or women of nobility, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. So Solomon went after the Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians. And Ashtoreth would have been uh, the female goddess co cohort of uh, Baal, all right? And we'll be reading more about Baal as we go on next week. Um, it says, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Amorites. So Milcom and Molech were gods that required child sacrifice. That's how abominable they were. And um, it says, verse 6, So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Kamash, the abomination of Moab, and for Moloch, the abomination of the Ammonites on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And he did, and so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. Wow. So he's got all these wives, and whoever their god was, oh, okay, we'll, we'll make a little worship place here for, for that god, and here's one for that god. And so all over the place there would have been these altars, high places, pillars of worship for these foreign pagan gods because he has broken God's command and has married these women. Um, but there's even more that he has broken here. In Deuteronomy 17, 17, and really that, that whole chapter talks about when you go into the land and, you know, when there'll be a, come a point that the, your people that will want a king, and so he's going to have some restrictions, and so we're going to read part of the restrictions here. Deuteronomy 17, 17 says, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself. Okay, now how many of you think 700 might qualify as many? <laughs> yeah. Okay, lest they test his heart, turn him away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive gold and silver. How many think he went a little excessive in receiving all of the gold and silver? Yeah, that too. And when he sits on the throne of the kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book, a copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priest. Okay, so he was required to take the laws of Moses and write them out in his own handwriting, but then have the Levitical priest double-check it, make sure it's all correct, that he has an accurate copy of the law that was given to Moses. And, and so he is to read it, in fact, in verse 19 says, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it in all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left. 
so that he may continue long in his kingdom and his children in Israel. So uh, what we see in the, in the Torah are these promises that were made to the king, instructions, promises. If, and if you do this, you're going to live long. You're going to have blessing and prosperity. If you get off track, you, there will be consequences. And God is faithful to his work, not just to the, the blessings and keeping the promises, but the consequences that come with disobedience. And so um, it, w- what we're seeing here in chapter 11, it didn't, this didn't just happen overnight. This is like later on, this is how many total he accumulated, all right? And, and, and so what we're seeing, he, it, he chose to, rather than to rely on this godly wisdom that he had received, to rely on worldly wisdom. Instead, and that'll get him and us in trouble any time. He decides he would rather go the way of the world than the way of God. But rather than be too critical, often we as people, when things are going really great, we move a little further away from God at times. When when we're struggling and things are going really bad, and if, you know, if you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you are praying, and you are on your knees, or your kid's sick, or something's going on, you are so close to God. But when things are going pretty well, money's in the bank, kids are doing well, life is good, um, you know, it's like, well, everything's pretty good. I don't need to talk to God today. I've got some more important stuff to do. And we don't use those words, of course, but we tend to just not feel like we need to rely on God quite as much. And so that could be that, um, you know, Solomon was reading his own press reports and believing every bit of it, how great he was, and that he didn't need God. Verse 9, And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and I will give it to your servant. Yet... For the sake of David, your father, I will not do this in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give you one tribe uh, to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. Wow. So he's, he's met with him twice. Time has passed. He's, uh, Solomon has gotten so off track, so God here is expressing his anger, his righteous anger, and, his, uh, and the consequences are coming, that are coming. But yet he says this isn't all going to take place during your lifetime because I made a promise to, to David, your father, who was a good king. And, and so it's not gonna ha- I'm not going to tear the kingdom away from you during your lifetime, but during that of your son. And so what he does start experiencing here, though, are some consequences in that it says in verse 14, the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. Okay, that would have been on the southern side of the kingdom. And throughout the Bible, we see conflicts with Edom. Edom are the descendants of Esau. Esau was the twin brother of Jacob. And so Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob was the son of the promise that had the 12 sons that became the 12 tribes that became the nation of Israel. Through Edom, we have rivals all the way down, you know, beginning in the womb, in Rebekah's womb, when they were wrestling in her womb, God said, you have two nations, and they will always strive against each other. It's still true today, Okay. Uh, still striving against each other. But here, this Edomite 
starts at attacking and causing some problems in the south. Then in the north, in verse 23, it says, God also raised up an ad uh, another adversary, Rezon. And so from the north, he begins uh, causing some issues. Then um, we see in verse 26, we're introduced to a guy by the name of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth. And he's a servant of Solomon, and it gives his, his credentials there. And we're going to see him for the next several chapters. There's going to be two guys going back and forth, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, okay? And so Jeroboam was a servant of Solomon, uh, Jeroboam. Rehoboam is a son of Solomon. It is so confusing, so I renamed Jeroboam Jerry. <laughs> and so when I'm reading it, Jerry is the servant. He's going to become king of the northern empire, okay? Uh, and I'll leave Rehoboam, son of, uh, of, of Solomon, as it is. Okay, so verse 29. And at that time, Jerry went out of Jerusalem, and the prophet Ahijah the Shilamite found him on the road. Now, Ahijah had dressed himself in a new garment, and the two of them were alone in the open company. Then Ahijah laid hold of the new garment that was on him, and he tore it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jerry, Take for yourself 10 pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and give you 10 tribes. But... He will have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel because they have forsaken me. And so he gives the reason and the gods that they've started following. So this is what we call, you know, a, a, a visual prophecy. This prophet has on a new garment. He comes, he sees Jerry out in the field, out in the open. He takes off his new garment and tears it into 12 strips representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He says, I'm going to give 10 to you, but one I'm going to give back to, uh, you know, I'm going to keep one intact because of David, because of Jerusalem, the holy city. Well, that just adds up to 11. What's happened with that last little fabric? Well, that's Benjamin the tribe of Benjamin, which has assimilated more into Judah. So from this point that's about to happen in chapter 12, we'll have the northern kingdom, which will be ten tribes, the southern kingdom, sometimes they call it two tribes, sometimes they call it one, because they have meshed together Judah and Benjamin, okay? Um, so he gives that prophecy, and... Uh, he says, you know, and you're going to rule over the other kingdom. He's telling Jerry this. In verse 38 it says, And if you will listen to all that I command you and will walk in my ways, he's giving God's word to him, and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did, I will be with you. And I will build you a sure house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. And I will afflict the offspring of David because of this, but not forever. Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jerry. But Jerry arose and fled to Egypt to Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon and all that he did in his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. So uh, Solomon had ruled 40 years. Before that, David had ruled 40 years. Before that, Saul had ruled 40 years. And those, that's the United Kingdom period. Now we're going into the divided kingdom period. But uh, rather than saying goodbye to Solomon right here, we're going to see him again in, in Second Chronicles, okay? And then we're going to read his books of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. So just save your hanky for later, all right? We're not going to shed any tears right now. Um, 
Maybe not then. <laughs> okay, so chapter 12. It says, so Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. Let's look at the map of the divided kingdom. And uh, the lower part, uh, the southern kingdom is going to be referred to as Judah. They take on, Judah was the largest of the ten, of the twelve tribes, excuse me. And, and so the nation is going to be called Judah here. The northern ten tribes are going to retain the name of Israel. Okay? Over the next uh, couple hundred years, they're going to, uh, well, they're going to have a series of 20 evil kings. Judah's going to have 20 kings also, but 8 to maybe 10, if you stretch it, are good. The others are evil. And so both, both nations are going to go into captivity, but the northern kingdom's going to go about 150 years sooner than the southern because they do have some good kings popping up here and again. Okay, so it says that they went to Shechem, which is right here kind of in the lower middle part of the green, Israel. So they go there to make him king. Not, uh, You know, it says um, to Shechem to make him king. And it says in verse 2, As soon as Jerry, the son of Nebat, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt. He'd gone down there for, you know, protection. Uh, where he had fled from King Solomon. Then Jerry returned from Egypt, and they sent and called him. And Jerry and all the assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam, Your father made our yoke heavy. Therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke, and we will serve you. So he said, well, go away for three days and let me think about it. So he, he goes and he talks to some older wise men that had served his fathers, and he said, what do you think? They, they, they say the yoke has been too heavy on them. They've been too burdened. If, the, if we'll lighten it, they'll serve us forever. The elder men said, that's exactly right. If you'll lighten the load on these guys, they will serve you faithfully forever. And he said, okay, let me think about it some more. Then he calls in his young friends. And they said, uh-uh, you're not going to do that. No, you tell them that your little finger is thicker than your father's thigh. And because they even asked for a lighter load, you're going to make it so much heavier and harder on them. And so Rehoboam took the advice of the young guys instead of the old. And that is, uh, as he began treating them harshly, verse 16, Let's skip on down to that, chapter 12, verse 16. And when all Israel saw what the king did and that he did not listen to them, the people answered, What portion do we have in David and no inheritance in the son of, of Jesse? To your tents, now look to the house of David. And so what they do here is now the nation divides in two. Ten of them are going to follow re, re, uh, I mean, Jerry, sorry, Jerry. And two of them are going to stay with Solomon's son because that's fulfilling a promise made to David through Solomon. So it will stay intact. There will be two nations. But the northern kingdom is um, going to set up Shechem in verse 25, it says, in the hill country of Ephraim. They're going to set that up right now as, as like their headquarters, their, um, their capital. The capital uh, of Judah will remain in Jerusalem. Later, we're going to see in a few chapters further on that Samaria is going to take the place of Shechem. We're going to be introduced to Samaria and just the problems that, that come with that. Uh, so what happens here in the rest of, of chapter 12 is Jerry gets tired of the people going back down to the south to the temple to have their festivals and feasts and sacrifices and religious worship. So he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make two calves, two golden calves. And it says, verse 28 here, So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, You've gone down to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. 
Does that ring a bell in anybody's ear? I mean, like those are the exact words that were said at Mount Sinai when Moses was up on the mountain so long that the people were like, we're restless, we're restless, you know, we're, he's not coming back, we need a God. And so Aaron, you know, took gold and made a golden calf there. Well, Jerry's making two golden calves. And he's putting one at Dan, if we could have that map up one more time. Uh, Dan was in the northern part of the, uh, right up here, the very northern part of the country. And then he put another one at Bethel, which is at the lower part on the, on the green. And so it was like, you don't need to go all the way to Jerusalem. Our gods, we we're, going to, we're going to put a couple of temples up, do your worship there. He didn't want them going back south and worshiping the one true God. Okay, chapter 13 tells about, it says, Behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord, and he goes to the north, to Bethel. And uh, Jerry was standing by the altar to make offerings. And this man cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord. And over and over in this chapter we see, by the word of the Lord. So here's a prophet. He, he comes, we find out later, he's a younger guy. He comes by the word of God and he finds Jerry who's at the altar and he says, this altar is going to be destroyed and, and turned uh, and uh, just fall to the ground. And he says, so Jerry puts his hand on the altar and says, you know, basically like, no, it's not. And his hand, Jerry's hand withers in his arm. And he's going, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and so, uh, the, but the, the prophet heals his arm. And so he goes, so Jerry says, well, why don't you come home with me tonight and eat at my house and stay with me? And the prophet said, and his name's never given here, but he goes, no, I cannot. God gave me strict orders to come here, give you this message, go back. He said, do not eat or drink in this area, so I can't. And so the prophet leaves. Well, uh, uh, word spreads quickly about what this prophet has done. And so this old prophet hears about it from his son, and he goes, go find that guy. I want to meet him. So uh, uh, the son finds him, takes his dad to him out in the, out in the country, and he says, uh, I he I've heard of what you have done. You're really a man of God. Uh, I want you to come to my house and stay and eat with me. And he says, I can't. The Lord told me not to eat or drink in this land to just get back. And he said, well, an angel of God told me that you could come and stay at my house and eat. And he says, okay. And so he goes and eats and stays at the guy's house. And when he leaves, he is attacked by a lion and, uh, and left there on the, on the road. He's found later, and, and the old prophet goes and is, is very sad about it. But, but what we see here is that he, was, he started off good again. He was obedient to begin with, but he didn't keep on being obedient to what God had told him to do, and he was deceived. He was deceived rather than listening to the Word of God. He listened to the Word of a man that contradicted the Word of God. Now, if you have something come to you and you feel like, well, God has just told me I need to do this, and it doesn't match up with it, and it's something that contradicts the word of God, don't do it. Don't do it. Well, yeah, but I feel like God told me because he wants me to be happy. There's not one place in here that says, God really wants you to be happy. God really wants you to be holy. He wants you to be obedient. He wants the very best for you, absolutely. But that comes with obedience. And so this guy um, dies as a result of his sin. He's buried, and the old prophet feels bad about it and says, when I die, bury me with him. Okay, chapter 14. And hopefully when you, you picked this up when you came in or you printed it off at home because I emailed it to you yesterday, we're going to be going through a lot of kings. And so on the left side of the page, it's yellow and white, and it has in yellow the kings and the year, beginning with the years that they served. 
like Rehoboam, 931 to 913 B.C. These are all B.C. dates. And it has his known, Rehoboam. And how did he start? Evil. How did he end? Evil. Who was a prophet during his time? Shemaiah. Where can we find out about him? And it has, you know, 1 Kings 12 and 14, 2 Chronicles 10 through 12. So, and then on the right side, green and white's the northern kingdom of Israel. So this will help you because in Kings, we're going back and forth, back and forth. And, and this, just hang on to this because we're going to use it through the rest of Kings and through First and Second Chronicles, which is a retelling of Samuel and Kings. Uh, but just focusing on the southern kingdom, on the line of David. So, um, anyway, chapter 14, it says, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, disguise yourself. And he says, Go find a prophet and see uh, if our son's going to be okay. And so she finds this prophet, and he says, No. Uh, your, your husband has been disobedient, has gone against what the Lord has said, and that son will die, but you will have another son. And that all takes place, okay? Um, and I know we're going fast. Skip down to verse 19. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warned and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. And the time that Jerry reigned was 22 years, and he slept with his fathers, and Nadab, his son, reigned in his place. Now, 20, verse 21, now Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, so we were in the north, now we're going back to the south, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city that the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And it gives his mother's name, and verse 22 says, And Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins they committed more than all their fathers had done. And so it talks about how they built these high places, pillars, places of pagan worship. And it says in verse uh, 24, and there was also male cult prostitutes in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations that the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Then it talks about in verse 25 how the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king's house. And they took away every, everything. He also took away the shields of gold. Remember how magnificent those were that Solomon had made. And so all of that was taken out by the king, this pharaoh from Egypt, came and took out a bunch of stuff. So Rehoboam's going to replace a lot of this gold with brass instead. So a lot of their their power and their wealth has been taken away. Um, then it says in verse 29, the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Rehoboam and Jerry continually, and Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And, and so we're going to see that the kings of the southern kingdom, yeah, the, almost all of them, as, especially here at the start, are going to be buried in the city of David. Remember, that's that little southern suburb of Jerusalem where David's buried. Now, all the, his descendants that are king are going to be buried along there with him. Whether they're good or bad, Rehoboam was evil. Chapter 15 says, In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Abijam, uh, began to reign over Judah, and he reigned three years. And it says in verse 3, And he walked in all the sins of his father that his father did, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. So his immediate father, the first one he's talk, they're talking about, Rehoboam, so he, uh, he followed in his... Uh, no, this is Jeroboam. See? Okay, Jerry. He followed his father, which was evil, and then um, we. Ha but these guys are all going to be compared to David. Were they good like David, or were they evil and not like David? And so we we see um, another king here listed. Then when we get to verse nine, we come to the reign of Asa 
in Judah. And he is one of the good kings in the southern kingdom. He comes along and he serves a long time. And he, he is one who is, who is really devoted to God and uh, does good, you know, almost all of his life. You know, he's not perfect, uh, but he is a, considered a good king and loyal to the Lord. As we go on through, he has a war, and, and it, we're going to see for 57 years, the northern and southern kingdom are at it with each other. Not like full-out warfare, but like continual little skirmishes here and there. This, this, this people that were all united as God's people have been ripped apart because of their disobedience. And, and believe me, it wasn't just the disobedience of the kings. I mean, the people are accountable as well. And so it talks about Basha, and he's, he's a, a king of the north, northern kingdom, Israel, and, and the battle that they had. And then in verse 25, it talks about the son of Jerry began to reign, and, and his reign in Israel followed by uh, Basha's reign. And, and so... It, it, Bosch is the end of his life, verse 34, says he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and he walked in the way of Jerry and in the sin which he made Israel to sin. So we see here the, de the decline of the nation. But it began with this great man of God, Solomon, a guy who was so totally devoted to to God at the beginning of his life, in the beginning of his reign, but through a series of choices, you know, not only did he lead to his demise, but the demise of his nation. Um, so what are you going to do with this Bible knowledge today? Because we went through a lot of chapters. We went quickly. That's why I, I say read it before you come because we don't have time to dig into every passage. Read it while we're here, what we're talking about, and then read it again, and going through it three times really helps you remember and understand better what's going on. But what are we going to do with it? We've got a lot of knowledge. Are we going to gain any wisdom out of this? Well, I was uh, reading a little devotional that our, that our pastor put together and staff. I go to Sugar Land Baptist. Choose this day. And it just seemed to go along with the choices. He, he writes, life is filled with choices. Some choices are monumental and they alter the course of our lives, like whom we will marry or what career we will pursue. Other choices are small, but their cumulative effect can have an equally significant impact on our lives. If you consistently choose broccoli over french fries walking over driving, and going to bed over time, over endlessly scrolling on your phone, you will eventually see a difference in your life. Therefore, physically, I can facilitate progress by consistently choosing to eat healthy foods, exercise, get plenty of rest. Spiritually, I can facilitate growth by consistently choosing to do things God's way instead of my way. I can choose to read and meditate upon God's word instead of consuming the junk food that is pop culture. I can spend time in prayer instead of constantly trying to fill every hour of every day with my own plans. I can choose to obey God's commandments even when it's difficult if I consistently do such things and if I consistently do such things over time, I'll begin to notice spiritual growth. Taylor Sandlin. Um, there is a slippery slope. We can be doing fine one day, and through a series of consistently bad choices, wrong choices, hit the skids. And it can change the whole direction of our lives. Or we can choose to daily open up the Word of God. Read it, meditate on it, obey His commands, seek His will, follow Him, 
and what a difference that will make. Will we have a perfect life? Does that ensure we'll never have sorrow? No, it doesn't. In this world, you're going to have trouble. Jesus told us that. But that he has overcome the world. And with him, we can be overcomers as well. Let's pray. Father God, we love you, our merciful Lord, and we thank you for the blessings you have given us. We need your help <laughs> to make the right choices for our bodies, for our minds, for our emotions, and most of all, for our souls. Guide us, O oh God, to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen.